unapologetically Canadian, unapologetically Torontonian, yet with an American title for the second time. The title has, um, I, I guess, to me, reflected a couple of things. Um, Toronto wants to be Chicago. Toronto would love to be, you know, one of the great cities of the world. Uh, we certainly are struggling trying to bring our waterfront up to the standards that Chicago achieved. Um, we are, in many ways, a wannabe city, and um, I, I think, as Canadians, we live in the shadow of the states. You know, culturally, um, in terms of our entertainment, our books. I read certainly in the 30 years that I've been reading crime fiction uh, thousands of American crime books and very few Canadian ma mainly because over the years there just weren't that many my writing I think is in many ways informed by American crime writing uh, Raymond Chandler and Ross MacDonald, Elmore Leonard uh, Robert Crace and Michael Connolly and Robert B. Parker those are all authors I've read exhaustively um, it's only recently that I think a lot of Canadian authors have brought, um, you know, their work into the the world spotlight, and uh, are doing, um, you know, equally good work. But uh, I think there's a bit of an American in all of us, uh, in terms of crime fiction. Um, certainly, the things we watch on television, we're all now a little bit better informed because of CSI. We've all watched Law and Order and. Uh, many of the other crime shows. And High Chicago uh, really was a double meaning. It's a poker game. Uh, as most people may know, it's a variation on seven card stud. And it also refers to the building of skyscrapers, uh, which is the subject of the book. Last book you took on the uh, pharmaceutical industry. This time you're taking on the real estate industry. You know, real estate and development is a subject to me that is rife with possibilities. The stakes are always high. The money is big. We've just seen in Toronto in the last month or so two projects, one at Young and Bloor, one at Young and Dundas, that are both teetering on the brink of bankruptcy. Uh, the, the money is just so huge and the projects can stall. And uh, I had a, a number of friends and acquaintances who are involved in it who were able to help me out, which also made it a good subject for me. I, I called upon them to say, um, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen to a builder? And they would say, finding PCBs on the site, finding old bones as you're digging, things that will stop a project cold. And when these projects stop, the money stops and people get desperate. And as a crime writer, you're always looking for desperate people who do desperate things. You have a very Trump-like... Um... Yes, his name is Simon Burke. Uh, I describe him as being like Donald Trump, except with hair that can be explained by science. Uh, he's a rival of Trump's in the book. And again, I think people who build huge towers have huge egos. That's one thing. Uh, they are building monuments, and I think they're monuments to themselves. And they don't appreciate when things go wrong, and they certainly don't appreciate when private detectives from Toronto poke their noses into their business. So I wanted Jonah to have an adversary who was powerful, who had far more resources, especially once he goes to Chicago to take this guy on. Um, he's in, Jonah is in Chicago without really any backup. Uh, he doesn't carry a gun. He's not licensed to work there. And Simon Burke has everything. He's got cops in his pocket and politicians in his pocket. He's got um, all kinds of thugs at his beck and call. And so, as again, as the stakes get higher, things get more dangerous for Jonah. And he has to push himself into that darker moral territory. His response, though, flabbergasted me. I mean, if you're going to go up against somebody big, I would think you'd come in and keep as low profile as possible. He does the complete opposite. He's not a cop. He doesn't have the weight of a badge or anything else behind him. He has to use his wits. And um, when I was writing those scenes, there, there had just been the story of some guys at a zoo in California who were throwing sticks and bottles at a tiger. And lo and behold, the tiger jumped out and mauled them. And that image stuck with me a bit because I thought Jonah's got to get Burke riled up. He's got to get him out of his comfort zone because he doesn't have weak spots. He can't attack him through lawyers. He can't attack him through the police. No one believes, as Jonah does, that Burke has been behind a series of killings in Toronto. 
So his idea is, well, let's throw a stick at the tiger and see what it does. And that's how he goes about it. It starts with what appears to be a suicide. There's a young woman who's the daughter of one of the developers who appears to have thrown herself off a building. And that in itself was an interesting sort of image and choice for the daughter of someone who builds tall buildings to have thrown herself off of one. Um, initially, the mother of this girl hires Jonah and Jen to find out why she might have done it. It's puzzling. She wasn't a depressive character. She seemed full of energy. Um, and the mother feels that she must have let her daughter down somehow and wants to know why she would have taken her own life. As they investigate, uh, they find signs that this was in fact murder, that the girl was thrown off of her building, and the question becomes who. The book is Hi Chicago. It's a Jonah Geller mystery, and I've been speaking with the author Howard Schreier and Hi Chicago, published by Vintage Canada, distributed by Random House.